Um, all right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's seven o'clock. Um, and that's right. Tonight's the night uh, that we conclude our study of the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, the Bodhisattva of Inexhaustible Intellect. Tonight's the night that it's going, we come to the end. Um, I have a tiny little bit left to read of the sutra. Otherwise, we covered the whole thing. This is um, part 32-ish of the whole. So it took us 30, about 32 uh, hour and a half long sessions to discuss this sutra. Um, I think... Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting ideas that are going to come up. Um, I'm not even going to really bother <laughs> introducing the sutra at this point. This is the this is the last class in that way. Um, it, it being the last class, this is going to be the class for questions, answers, ideas, comments, epiphanies about the Bodhisattva path. Tonight's the night. Um, but let me, at least, you know, until I feel like it, it doesn't, until I feel like it doesn't make sense anymore, let me go ahead and, and begin to read the end of the sutra um, in order to contextualize tonight's whiteboard drawing mural. Um, again, yep, this is, of course, this is the, uh, the, the 45th sutra in the collection of jewels, the heap of jewels. This has been the Bodhisattva Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra that has told us all about developing bodhicitta, developing a mind of enlightenment or an enlightened mind. <clears throat> we've, been, we've been a long ways. And after all of that, after all of those sessions and all of those ideas and all of those stages and all of those paramitas and all of those visions and all of those Dharanis, then at that time in the assembly, a God named Lion Banner of Unimpeded Light rose from his seat bared his right shoulder, knelt upon his right knee, faced the Buddha with palms joined together and said, how wonderful, world honored one. How wonderful, Sugata, the well gone one. This Dharma, this Sutra, this teaching is so profound and so extensive that it comprises all the teachings of the Buddha. <laughs> Thereupon, the Buddha told, lion banner of unimpeded light. So it is, so it is. It is as you have said. If a bodhisattva can hear and accept this Dharma, this teaching, even temporarily, he or she will never regress from the pursuit of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And why? Because that good man or good woman has planted mature roots of virtue and therefore he or she will be impressed by this sutra upon hearing it. Bodhisattva, if a man or a woman hears this sutra, all the good roots that they have planted will be purified. And consequently, they will not feel fail to see the Buddha, listen to the Dharma, and make offerings to the Sangha and bring sentient beings to maturity. I'm going to pause right there for a moment because we're, we're about to get a new section. So I just want to introduce our friend here, contextualize a few things. 
So this is the end of the sutra. And this is a, of course, if you haven't noticed, this is a Maha Yana Sutra. <laughs> this is a sutra of the great vehicle. Uh, it's why it takes 32 weeks to discuss it. it. It is so profound in that way. And, you know, this of course is, is what the, the God, the God lion banner of unimpeded light. That's what this God has come to, to say. My goodness, Buddha, it's, it's, it's as if this sutra contains, contains it all. And the Buddha basically says, so it is, so it is. This teaching contains it all. And, you know, that's sort of why I said I wanted to do this sutra, because it was the whole bodhisattva path in one sutra, kind of hard to find in a way. Um, and indeed, it's profound in that sense. Um, I think, yeah, before I go on, I want to read the next section. I think it's sort of, um, it's very beautiful what's about to happen, but I want to like make clear where we're at with our friend here. So, um, without at, actually at the risk, <laughs> at the great risk of starting this all over again, I want to, I want to, I want to remind you that at the beginning of this sutra, you know, the Buddha was dwelling at uh, uh, near Rajagriha, the uh, Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak, right? And it was at that time, oh, oh, sorry. And at that time, there was this assembly of bodhisattvas and among them was bodhisattva wisdom banner, uh, bodhisattva dharma banner, Bodhisattva moon banner, Bodhisattva sun banner, Bodhisattva boundless banner. So that gets mentioned at the beginning of the sutra. And now at the end of the sutra, we have this, this God appear. Um, you know, it's a God. I don't, you know, <laughs> no much more to say than that, but this God's name is of course here this uh, um, unobstructed light lion banner. So they do lion banner of unimpeded light or unobstructed light. I'm kind of reading it here from the, Ch the Chinese here. And there's of course a few, a few very different ideas in there. The idea of unimpeded or unobstructed, unhindered would be also the language of that. Um, that's this idea of the varanas, the coverings, this idea of the obstructions. And so nivarana, nivarana without obstruction, nivarana prabha, unobstructed light, nivarana prabha simhadvaja, that's the name of this God. And I wanted to attempt this sort of back translation to the Sanskrit. Again, I'm working from the Chinese because we only have the sutra in Chinese, but you can kind of reconstruct what the Sanskrit name of this being would have been. And again, it's about this idea of being nivarana, unobstructed, but that's actually about the light the light, an unobstructed light, okay? I wanna talk about unobstructed light this, this evening. And then it's the lion banner. The metaphor of the lion at this point, you know, if, especially if you have been here through all these different sessions, we spent a whole night <clears throat> on the lion metaphor in Buddhism, <clears throat> excuse me, it was one of the inexhaustible aspects of this sutra that we spent a whole night in basically just talking about lion metaphors and how that factors into this. So I don't want to repeat much of the metaphor about the lion. And this is about lion banner. So, oh, and the, what I will repeat very quickly about the lion is you know, in Buddhism, the lion is very much a metaphor of 
sovereignty in that sense of, of um, kings and queens, king of the jungle, queen of the jungle kind of thing. Um, so sovereignty is an aspect of the lion metaphor and fearlessness <clears throat> is also very much an aspect of the, of the lion metaphor. There are many, many, many others, but I wanna give you a sense or a feeling for this lion banner. This is this uh, Dvaja. And, you know, I have spoken in the past about banners. I, I kind of drew what would be a typical banner, <clears throat> the idea of a, a banner that might have a, uh, a crest or a symbol or an emblem or maybe some writing, right? But the thing that I've mentioned in the past very quickly <clears throat> about banners in Buddhism. Yes, there's an, an aspect of banners that's about victory, like the, the idea of the victory banner in that sense is, is sort of, it's in there. But there's an aspect to banners that in the, and I've said this in, in other Dharma talks, but I, I'll say it again, that there's an aspect about banners that is lost, I think, a little bit in the modern world. And what I mean by that is, is that in our modern world, you know, 21st century, 20th century, actually, the 20th century very much, we are telecommunicators, right? And this idea of telecommunication, it's not just about a, a telephone, right? Because it started with telegraphy, right? Telegraphy, Morse code, T the telos is about a point at the end at a distance. So any kind of teleological, te telecommunication is about communicating at a distance. M more, more than my voice could reach, let's say. So, you know, a telegraph line, telegraph lines eventually, you know, went all the way around the world. Tele, uh, telecommunication lines went all the way around the world. I'm, this is all the way around the world now. So we're telecommunicators, but the idea of communicating at a distance in the pre-modern world was also available. They didn't have telegraphy, they didn't have telephones or televisions, right? But there were forms of communication at a distance. And one of those forms of telecommunication at a distance was by using banners. A, there's a remnant of this in the modern world, which is semaphore. Uh, the military uses semaphore. Other groups use semaphore, which is where you would use different colored flags or the flags would have different patterns on them. And depending on whether you were raising one flag up and one flag down, you could basically do a kind of telegraphy, but it's not uh, writing, it's not graphy. It's a, 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 with a flags in that way or banners. My whole point about that is, is that anytime you see the idea of a banner in Buddhism, they're definitely sort of speaking about telecommunication. It's an aspect of banners. Again, there's, a, there's a other aspects to banners as well, but something that I think we miss is that banners were a part of this sort of telecommunication. And well, I guess just to plant an interesting seed or an interesting idea, Regarding these beautiful sutras that we explore Sunday nights in the Dharma doors and all of that, that there's a way in which Buddhism is, is very aware of the written, the written word as an, a weird form of telecommunication, but not over space, but over time, right? And so I just wanted to like, share that with you, that idea of like, that 
these banners are evoking a kind of the mystery of telecommunication by which i mean communicating at a distance and that might be time or space or both in that way so <laughs> okay so that's our god i just wanted to give this god a proper introduction there right uh, by the way i do have much more to say about unimpeded light so this is this uh, lion banner, unimpeded light God, who showed up in awe, showed up in awe, saying, wow, it's as if, it's as if this sutra contained it all, right? So that's where we're at. Again, I just wanted to give a good introduction to our friend here. The Buddha, of course, says it's, yeah, you're right. So it is. So it is. This, can, this sutra contains all of that. And then the Buddha goes on to say that, oh, 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 and I also wanted to pause on this too. It's actually, I wanted to stop before we go on because I emphasized, or I, I meant to emphasize that this, at the end of the sutra, the Buddha, the Buddha, says if uh, virtuous or i mean it's it's a tricky language problem but if good virtuous men or women hear this sutra they will never rest from the pursuit of supreme and pastor uh, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment and why because that good man or good woman has planted and matured various roots of virtue, and therefore he or she will be impressed by this sutra upon hearing it. I wanted to emphasize that because, um, yes, even though it's binary, it's actually very rare to find sort of this equal language within sutras where it's very clear that this is for everybody in, in a way. There's a bunch of sutras where it's kind of implicit that this is for everybody. But one of the reasons why I have chosen to spend a lot of time on the Ratnakuta collection, right? So this book I read from, A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, right? This is a partial translation of a collection of sutras. And I'm really interested in this collection of sutras because most of the sutras in them either have very strong female protagonists in that sense, or they are very, very explicit about their sexual equality. There's a lot where, so what, what I'm getting at is, is that for this sutra to very explicitly emphasize the sexual equality of this teaching is very in line with the Ratnakuta collection. And it's why I'm like really into the Ratnakuta collection. Um, it seems, you know, if you haven't heard this before, it's part of the earlier teachings of this, uh, this, uh, this particular sutra earlier on, I mentioned this. The Ratnakuta collection, if you do some scholarly kind of anthropological, archaeological research, you start to find that the Ratnakuta Sutra collection was kind of basically the library of a particular Buddhist uh, community in Central Asia. And there's writings about this, uh, dissertations about this, but if you've heard of like the Lotus Sutra, the Lotus Sutra is also kind of an anthology of sutras. It's kind of a bunch of smaller uh, sutras or teachings that are kind of collected into a kind of an anthology format. If you read the Avatamsaka Sutra, it's also quite a, a assemblage of sutras in a way. And what I'm, what I'm getting at is actually that the Lotus Sutra seems to have represented a particular Buddhist community and their uh, Dharma, their teachings, their Sutra in a way. Ratnakuta seems to have been a community. The Avatamsaka seems to have been a community. And so I'm very interested in the community that, that put all these together. 
in, in other words. So I just wanted to pause and really emphasize that, um, again, if you go back and you read the original languages in which these um, sutras are recorded, they're, again, they're making this very clear emphasis about sort of the um, the equanimous, the equanimous nature of these teachings, shall we say? Yeah. Okay. That being said, if a good man or good woman hears the sutra, all the good roots that they've planted will be purified, and cons consequently, they will not fail to see the Buddha, listen to the Dharma, and make offerings to the Sangha and bring many sentient beings to maturity. Not only that, these good men and good women will attain the inseparable ocean mudra dharani. More dharanis. And actually, before I start to read these, I, I want you to know we're about to get the Buddha is about to unleash a whole new list of Dharanis on us that the Bodhisattva attains. Um, the English translators here have translated that, that the Bodhisattvas will not be separated from these various Samadhis. And, you know, that's a translator's choice. But in terms of the way this actually reads in the original language, it's not that they will not be separated from all of these Dharanis. It's that these Dharanis, and see, you know, the last two episodes if you're confused about Dharanis, but these Dharanis, it's not that the Bodhisattva will be not separated from them. It actually, if you read it again in, in the Chinese, these Dharanis are all called and I guess this is where in English, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, grammatically, we can't really quite do this. But these Dharanis, and remember, these Dharanis are, are maybe mnemonic devices. They're, they're memory aids. They're remembrances. They're, these are tricky ideas. And what it says in, in terms of the language is that, like, these Dharanis one couldn't, it's, it's the in, inseparable, like you can't be parted, you cannot be parted from the, and this is the Dharani that you can't be parted from. So the inseparable is what I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with inseparable. So these good men and good women will attain the unsepar inseparable ocean seal or ocean mudra dharani, the inseparable boundless manifestations dharani. They will attain the inseparable penetrating the desires and mentalities of all sentient beings sama, or dharani. They will attain the inseparable banner of pure sunlight dharani. They will attain the inseparable banner of stainless moonlight. They will attain the inseparable breaking all bonds, Dharani. They will attain the Dharani that destroys boundless afflictions that are as large as a mountain of diamonds. They will attain the inseparable Dharani that understands the words expressing the equality of all dharmas. They will attain the inseparable Dharani of understanding the language and voice of reality. They will attain the, the inseparable Dharani imprinted by the seal of boundless purity as revealed through emptiness. <laughs> and they will attain the inseparable Dharani that achieves and manifests boundless Buddha bodies. Akshayamati Bodhisattva. 
if a bodhisattva achieves dharanis like these, they will then be able to transform themselves into Buddha forms in order to teach sentient beings in all the lands in all 10 directions. However, in light of the true nature of all dharmas, there is neither coming nor going. There is neither teaching nor any sentient being to teach. They do not cling, bodhisattvas do not cling to the words they use to teach the dharma. They are impartial and steadfast. Although manifesting a body that lives and dies, in reality, nothing ever arises or ceases. Not a single dharma ever comes or goes. Realizing that all phenomena are originally quiescent and thus abiding securely in the Buddha Dharma. How so? Because the Bodhisattva makes no distinctions among dharmas. During the teaching of this sutra, 30,000 bodhisattvas in the assembly achieved the patient tolerance for the non-arising of all dharmas. Innumerable bodhisattvas attained the state of non-regression from pursuit of anuttara samyak sambodhi. Innumerable sentient beings resolved to develop anuttara samyak sambodhi, the enlightened mind of bodhicitta, and innumerable bhikshus and bhikshunis, monks and nuns, attained a clarified dharma eye. And when the Bodhisattva, and when the Buddha finished teaching this sutra, Bodhisattva Akshayamati and the monks and the nuns and the gods and the humans and the asuras and the Gandharavas and so on were all jubilant. And they accepted it with faith and began to practice it with veneration. <laughs> okay, so I, I wanted to make sure to finish the sutra because that could be dangerous. Um, and now we can unpack all of these different ideas. So, you know, this is a, a, a big ending here. We have a God show up out of nowhere, um, an extraordinary being. The Buddha then tells us that actually the Bodhisattva who practices, understands, receives this sutra actually attains all these other Dharanis too. So I wanna talk about all the other Dharanis or kind of give you a, a like a blow by blow on those, right? Um, and then I wanna talk about a few of those key ideas at the end in particular about the patient tolerance for the non-arising of all dharmas and the non-regressing state for the pursuit of enlightenment and the development of bodhicitta, right? Those are mentioned at the end. Oh, and the clarifying the dharma I. So that's what I wanna to try to talk about tonight are those kind of four interesting ideas at the end. Um, but also sort of deal a little bit with these Dharanis. Um, but primarily, though, too, because this is the last night, I want to answer any questions or address any ideas that anybody has. So let's start there, actually, because I'm I feel confident now that we've read it. That we can... So any questions about either what I read or Bodhisattva Path, Akshay Mati? I go for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to comment. I, I don't know if you talk about it, but I was personally thinking. So you already talked about Dharanis as these mnemonic devices between the sound <clears throat> of the Dharani itself and X. <laughs> Excellent. I was thinking about one X, which is the Samadhis. The Dharanis being these mnemonics, not to remember teachings, but to go or to penetrate samadhis. Fascinating. Yeah. So 
But I haven't made that relationship between the list of Darani is given, either of the two lists of Darani yep. and the one list of Samadis that we have. But I don't know. What do you think about it, man? Um, I, I, I really, really like what you're uh, suggesting about these Duranis, that they might be more like... Um, yeah, I mean, frankly, man, yeah, as soon as you say that, I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's it. That's, <laughs> but what I'm, what the thought that came to my mind is, you know, there, um, there are certain things in this world, right? And, and there's something very interesting about how it can happen that just a smell could really bring you back somewhere and really unpack a lot of memories, right? And so I'm not suggesting that there are Durrani smells, although that's a very interesting idea. But what I am suggesting, riffing off of what Eric just said, is that that, that idea that these Duranis, that these sounds, it's not even about the information and data that they contain. It could possibly almost be like a feeling that they evoke by their very sound that based on what Eric said could sort of take one right back to that samadhi. It's almost the sound of that samadhi in a way. And, and I think that's a, a excellent way of thinking about this, Eric, an excellent comment, because I do think these Duranis are operating at, the, at even more subtle levels than smell memory and sense memory and things like that, but are along those lines, so. Um, Everybody cool? Everybody chilling? Yeah, no. Um, just a small question. The community for whom the Ratna, uh, mm. the, 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 this was sort of their body of sutras? Yep. Was that in China? Central Asia. Central Asia. So we, we have a Chinese translation of it only, but that's not because that's the only one that exists. There is that that was a translation or, or rather that that's not the original so real quick on that so the ratnakuta is a collection of 49 sutras the whole collection of 49 sutras was translated into chinese actually several times so we have many chinese translations of all 49 of these we have sanskrit what would be considered original we have Sanskrit or original versions of a lot of them, but not all of them. And this is one that I don't think we have a uh, original version of. Just sounds like a wonderful project to figure out what this little society was up to with all these egalitarian sutras. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I have to tell you on that note too, um, I mean, all of this too is history that remains to be written. You know, this is all like drawing from a bunch of different sources that exist, but nobody's written that one study yet in that way. But, you know, a lot of um, Mahayana Buddhism, uh, a lot of these sutras, especially ones like the Lotus Sutra, Avatamsaka Sutra, Ratnakuta Sutra, they all are coming out of the the. Uh, the Kush Valley, the Kuchen uh, Empire, you know, and it's like, you know, maps and things are funny because nowadays that's practically not even on the map. Yeah. Whereas in like the year, like 100, 200, 300 AD, it was the map. <laughs> they, they were the map makers. <laughs> like it's a kind of, um, anyways, my point is, is that that, um, that world of the Kush Valley and these Buddhist little kingdoms, there's a, um, a history that needs to be written because there's accounts, multiple accounts of this one interest. And I, get, I, I share this with you as an anecdote just to entice you, right? There seems to have been around the year, I guess this would have been around the year in the mid 600s AD mid 600s AD in uh, Central Asia, the Kush Valley region, there seems to have been a kind of small um, kingdom 
in which there was a king. But they, it was a Buddhist kingdom. The, the ruler, sovereign in that sense, was a wheel-turning sage king, by all accounts, very wise person, very beloved by the community. And what the, this is, you know, again, this is multiple accounts of this. This king was so beloved that people would just um, heap, um, off, you know, uh, not offerings because I didn't think he was a holy person, but they would just give gifts, gifts upon gifts from lo like local kingdoms, but also like the, the populace would just shower this guy with gifts. And at the end of each year, he would give it all away to the point where he stood basically naked. I mean, they say he was like in a loincloth, but he was basically, he had given everything away. And over the course of the next year, people would just keep it, you would be like, oh, he's so great, he gave it all away. And so at the end of the year, after amassing all of this wealth, it would do a jubilee and he would redistribute all the wealth. And it was considered a utopic community of economic exchange where, <laughs> I mean, so again, I tell you that as an anecdote of, a, of these little Buddhist experimental communities that might have been less, not just experimental in that way. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> okay, um, on these Duranis, by the way, so these are some pretty heavy, beautiful Duranis you know, the, the Durrani's that we encountered before, you know, the Durrani of uh, superior blessing, the well-abiding Durrani, these all sound boring compared to the ones that we just read, right? And I, and, and I want to remind you that my approach, my approach to these <clears throat> Mahayana Sutras is they have a sense of humor. And I think if you miss that they are being humorous, you, you, miss, you miss a lot of smiles, actually, I think, in that way. In other words, you know, and I, I had already mentioned this that, um, when we talked about Durrani's. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, actually, I just remembered, we talked about this when I first talked about the Samadhis. And so you'll remember that in this sutra, it talks about the Bodhisattva, attaining 10 different samadhis. And I mentioned, you know, that that was part of um, the attainment of samadhis, the attainment of these meditative states that, you know, these were called samapati attainments, this idea of like uh, accomplishments even. And in early kind of more monastic Buddhism, these attainments were like a big deal. And, and these um, samapatis were, were significant. And I think there's a way in which um, a lot of this Mahayana really um, hyperbolic, super superlative, like these really big names and all this stuff, I think it's actually kind of like, well, it's, I don't think it's quite a critique it's not quite a critique or putting down the earlier tradition of attainments, but I think that it's, it is a kind of, um, um, a sort of a form of poeticism where it is in the very verbose, uh, big, big words, big language kind of thing where there's actually um, teachings taking place, smiles taking place, like there's a lot taking place in a Mahayana Sutra when it, when it starts to talk about all these Dharanis. In other words, I don't think they're necessarily talking about specific, you know, badges of attainment in that way. It's sort of more uh, within the spirit of, of um, hyperbole in that sense. But I don't want to, again, but I don't want to make it sound it, like it's just hyperbole. I think there is teaching here in that way. So for example, again, these are all inseparable Duranis. These are all these uh, remem uh, remembrances 
uh, Dharanis that are inseparable from the, the, the Bodhisattva. The first one is called the ocean mudra. Um, this word mudra is gonna be, yeah, if you have this edition, the word mudra is often translated as seal, um, like a wax seal in a way, like a, um, like a seal or like a, a hermetic seal actually is probably more to the point. Um, and that word seal is actually the word mudra. And, you know, just to go through these, to give you a little bit of like, um, um, just to give you some things to work with with, the, with each of these. So of course the word mudra Although you might think of it as the various hand gestures that uh, can be made or that Buddhas make or Bodhisattvas make, it's important to know that mudras can be done with the hands and the feet, the legs, that is like a full lotus posture is considered a mudra. There's even mudras that you can actually do with your uh, head as well. But it's important to know that the word mudra it's not, it, the reason why it means a seal is that it actually means like a lock or a seal with the general idea that we sort of, you know, the, the original idea of mudras was that we exude or almost sort of leak prana or what the Chinese call chi, that through our extremities, our hands, our feet, and our head, we kind of leak prana, vital life force energy. And so there's various techniques that you can do to seal or lock in the vital life force energy. And so traditionally in Buddhism, you do a dhyana mudra like this, and you do a padmasana mudra, which is the full lotus posture. And you can imagine that those both, you know, especially a full lotus posture, that really locks in the energy. Um, you know, I don't, if you've ever mustered up the, 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 the limber, if you've ever mustered up the limber to get into a full lotus, it gets hot. It gets hot down there. And the idea is, is that you're locking in the vital life force energy. And indeed, if you cup your hands in any way, you'll notice a buildup of heat. Even if you notice if you put your hands open palms out you can feel it literally like a, it doesn't take a qigong master to actually feel the coolness exuding from the hands and if you bring it in you'll start to feel the little chi ball form i digress the idea is is that the word mudra originally comes from these seals or locks this is not one of those seals or locks this is the ocean samadhi or sorry the ocean dharani but, you know, as soon as you mention the word ocean within the world of Buddhism, it, it kind of evokes a lot of ideas <laughs> in that way. And so this is the Dharani that sort of locks in that oceanic metaphor, maybe. You could maybe think of it that way. Again, I'm not going to give you any real definitive uh, answers here to what these Dharanis mean, because I'm already said, I don't know what Dharanis are exactly. <laughs> and I'm trying to trying to be open about what this final section refers to. Um, these, so the Bodhisattva attains this inseparable ocean seal Dharani. The second one is this Dharani, an inseparable Dharani, of course, of boundless manifestations. Um, that's a kind of a wild idea right there. We could, we could be there all night talking about boundless manifestations. Um, uh, manifestations is sort of appearances in that sense. Um, but uh, I guess I shouldn't, I can't, there's no reason to beat around the bush because this is the last night. A, a bodhisattva at this stage of the game, right? Who, you know, we, we are to assume that the Bodhisattva Shayamati has made it. Um, so a Bodhisattva at the upper levels is um, said to have the ability to basically change their appearance at will. 
in that sense. Um, this is understood as either being able to determine one's own rebirth and kind of keep coming in and out of the world as one pleases, but this is also understood as sort of shape-shifting. I could appear, however, uh, I could appear differently to different people in that sense. Um, all of this, of course, is up about upaya. Um, the sutra even says this idea about that the bodhisattva who hears this sutra, practices this sutra, who attains these dharanis, that they're able to bring many sentient beings to maturity. And the idea is, is that upper level bodhisattvas are able to make themselves appear however is necessary in order to communicate the Dharma. And you could interpret that a variety of ways as well. Um, but I do believe that that is part of what this Dharani is referring to is that this Bodhisattva also attains infinite or boundless manifestations. The third Dharani, this is all going to start making a little more sense now that I've put it in that context. The third Dharani is this inseparable Dharani that penetrates the desires and mentalities of all sentient beings. And yes, this is a reference to that classic supernatural power, that classic Siddhi, that classic ability of yogis, mahasiddhas, bodhisattvas, and buddhas, the ability to read other people's minds. I think it's important to know, or it's important to keep in mind that the Buddha and Buddhist sutras, they never talk about reading people's minds. It's actually always about knowing the inclinations of sentient beings and, and or, and or knowing the afflictions of the minds of sentient beings and, their, and therefore the inclinations that those uh, afflictions would bring about. And again, just because I'm kind of trying to say a little something about each of these, I've, I've, I've revealed this in other Dharma talks, so I won't keep it a secret from you. I have often re revealed my understanding of this siddhi, that of this supernormal power, which is sometimes called, uh, I guess, uh, telepathy in that sense. But you know, I think when people hear this idea, they they think uh, uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink. They they think that it's like this actual kind of like tapping into the internal dialogue of someone and knowing what they're thinking. But actually, if you read the language about knowing the inclinations of all beings and knowing the afflictions of the minds of all beings, that actually really kind of helps put, a, a, put this in a clearer light, which is, you know, this whole Buddhist project is about understanding greed, anger, and delusion. That's really kind of what this whole project is about. Understanding it in ourselves, understanding, you know, addictive wantiness, and understanding uh, bitter anger, and understanding, you know, delusional behavior. That's always part of this. And there's a way in which we're working on understanding our own, but there's also a way in which there's a, a level of deep compassion that comes from, you know, really being cognizant of the fact that we are all suffering from these. And we all suffer differently from these things, which I think is part of the problem or the disconnect is that it's easy to, to sympathize with people who are suffering the same way that I am. But then people suffer different ways and it might come across as arrogance or it might come across as a bunch of things that then I can't be sympathetic towards because I don't suffer that way. But it's, I think, important from a 
Buddhist perspective to know or keep in mind all beings are suffering, all animals, all, all creatures, all sentient beings are suffering from these three poisons in their own way. Everybody kind of is wanty, everybody's kind of angry, <laughs> everybody's a little confused in that way, and then we're all acting from that. My point is that wisdom about the, the kleshas, as they're called, the afflictions or the defilements, the poisons, the understanding of that, I actually think is what gives one the ability to know the inclinations of all sentient beings and to know the afflictions of the minds of all beings, because it's the same um, program. It's the same operating program for all beings in that way. And so if you understand the software, you understand the program, the hardware, whether it's a, a cat suffering, a god suffering, or my landlord suffering, or whoever, there's a way that you can understand it because we're all suffering from the same thing in that way, but differently. So, yeah. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, a bodhisattva would basically be locked into some Durrani that sort of embodies that teaching that I just sort of tried to communicate. <laughs> The next few, the next two Duranis put us in an interesting place as far as our talk tonight goes. So I'm going to do them together. There is the inseparable Durrani of the banner, the banner of pure sunlight and the inseparable Durrani of the banner, also a banner of stainless moonlight. So there we have two, uh, the sun and the moon, sun as pure, the moonlight as stainless. And these are both, by the way, they are both um, Duranis that are called the banner of sunlight and the banner of moonlight, but these particular kinds of sunlight and these particular kinds of moonlight. And I just wanted you to notice, if you didn't notice it already, that our God here is carrying this lion banner. And this is the lion banner of unimpeded light. Well, wait a minute, light and the sunlight and the moonlight, and they're all being spoken about in terms of banners. And that actually has a lot to do with my opening remarks about banners as it pertains to telecommunication. What I mean is, is that the sun and the moon are very far, long ways away, but the light gets here. So it's a, it is a subtle form of telecommunication. And if you understand fiber opt optic cables, it's an even more subtle re uh, relationship between telecommunication and light. So yeah, don't, <laughs> there's a lot too of the, this idea. Um, maybe I should take the time now. I had a few different ideas that I wanna work in here. Let me take the time now to discuss the banner of unimpeded or unobstructed light. And this is sort of going to be part of explaining, of course, the banner of sunlight and banner of moonlight Duranis that we just encountered. So, and, and I don't have a lot of time and I have a lot of ideas. So this is going to be a quick one. Light. Let's talk about light. So here's the interesting thing about light. Um, so, um, the interesting thing about light is that in a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of traditions, not just Buddhism, light and knowledge are very related. And you can start to think about the actual very idea and word enlightenment. What does it mean to be enlightened, right? So here we are right now, smack dab into a conversation about light and knowledge, okay? 
something interesting to think about as it pertains to light and knowledge is imagine you're in a dark room and you're fumbling about trying to figure out what's going on. You're trying to figure out how big the room is, what's in the room, where you are, all of these things. Imagine now somebody clicks on a light. All of a sudden, oh, I can see everything that's going on now. A minute ago, I was in the dark because the lights weren't on, but somebody put the light on and now I can see. So interesting relationship between actual light and knowledge. Like literally light leading to knowledge. Everybody follow me on that? I know it's like, <laughs> but that relationship so what I'm getting at is, is that it's, again, it's not just Buddhism, where in which knowledge, like you could kind of, you could kind of think of this as two different ways, knowledge and knowing things, that there's an, an aspect of luminosity to that. Or we could do it the other way around that there is an aspect of knowledge to light. And that's what I was getting at with my, in being in a dark room, turning on the lights, and now I can know things. So let's just kind of like, you know, think about that for a second, that weird, it's linguistic, but it's also physics. And it's also kind of like life in a weird way. Like, wow, all of a sudden light and knowledge are much, much more intimately connected than I thought a moment ago, right? So now let's talk about sunlight and moonlight or, you know, or lamplight for that matter. And what I mean is, is that sunlight is obstructible. It's obstructible. It's why we might seek shade, you know, because sunlight is obstructible. You can obstruct it. And, and again, that is a good thing if you're seeking shade in that way. Moonlight too, of course, is very obstructible. Um, lamplight is obstructible. In other, in other words, the lamplight in my room here is blocked by the walls. And actually the other room, at least the other room that way in my house is dark because the lamplight is obstructed. Okay, so now I've introduced to you the language of obstruction and we have this kind of interesting idea about knowledge and light going on, right? So this is lion banner unobstructed light. Lamplight and sunlight and moonlight are obstructed or obstructable. This is a different light. This is unobstructed light. Um, I'm going to mention this very, very quickly in passing. If you're not familiar with the idea of obstruction in Buddhism, it is the exact same idea of being of hindered. And then we are also talking about being unhindered, unobstructed, unhindered. Those are all ideas that relate to, <clears throat> excuse me, nivarana or unobstructed re relates to the, var the varanas, these obstructions. And traditionally in Buddhism, there are five hindrances. There are five nivarana that cover us. These are sensual desire or kama, vyapada, anger or bitterness, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and the fifth is doubt or indecisiveness. Actually, for this quick Dharma talk, not doubt, indecisiveness. So there's this way that indecisiveness and anxiety and apathy or sloth and anger and desire are these five obstructions, five hindrances. So whenever you hear the language of being unobstructed or unhindered in Buddhism, they mean without 
doubt, without anxiety, without all of those five. And so there is a light, a different light, not the light of the sun, not the light of the moon, not the light of a lamp, but there is a different light, an unimpeded light. And this is essentially a kind of light of knowledge, a light of wisdom that Buddhism will talk about. And there's a way of understanding this light of knowledge as being unobstructed. Indeed, even in a way, unobstructable. You, you couldn't obstruct it in that sense. And I just want to share with you just so that we can, you know, have an even better time tonight. I want to share with you a, 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 a way to understand this idea by no means the way and by no means the only way, but a way to understand this. It's a way that I understand it. You can kind of think about it like this. And, and I've, I've mentioned this example before, but imagine or think about someone who can track animals using their footprints, right? And there's a way in which, of course, what's amazing about a really good uh, tracker, a really good uh, person that can do that, you know, is they come across a, a hoof print or a paw print, footprint, and, you know, based upon how deep it is, but also based upon the way the footprint slides, you know, they're able to kind of induce or just understand a variety of phenomena that are no longer present. They were present, but they're no longer present in that way. And it's sort of like, the idea is, is that if a non-tracker someone that is not trained in that comes across the same footprint that our tracker comes across, the, the non-tracker person that's not trained in that would just see the footprint that the sunlight is revealing. The one that's just, it's there. But the tracker who has knowledge and has wisdom is, is seeing things that are no longer there, but that they were there. You could almost actually think of this as the tracker that their vision is not obstructed by time, right? Whereas the other person, the non-tracker, their obstruction is time. They can only see the footprint as it appears right now, but the other person, you know, it, again, is applying knowledge and wisdom and able to see other things there. And in a sense, insofar as we, you know, understand that this is an actual uh, tracker who is correct in that sense, not just making things up, but who can actually see kind of the animal and how big it was and how fast it was moving, right? Well, there's a way in which that person, that tracker, via knowledge and wisdom is seeing something. But again, it's not with sunlight, moonlight, or lamplight. It's a different light. And, and I already alluded to how that knowledge or wisdom is slightly unobstructed by time, unobstructed by space in a certain sense. And I give you that idea of uh, tracker vision the vision of a tracker that can see more than the naked eye, as they say, right? I offer that as a, a way of thinking about unimpeded knowledge, like across the board. It, it, like that you could be a tracker of reality and that from any given Dharma, you could induce or deduce the entire Dharma Datu in a way right? So that's sort of a suggestion for what is sort of being implicated by this idea of, of our uh, God, again, a God, unimpeded light lion banner. Questions, comments, answers about banners of light of various sorts. <laughs> awesome. 
Um, oh, I had something really Oh, yeah, Ramit, sorry. Uh, so you mentioned that the banners are kind of like, um, like in in this context, in this setting, it's it's almost like a message across space and time, in a sense, right? Um, and so and so this God, you know, being a representation of this um, knowing, this unobstructed seeing, uh, is in a sense like the way the way you know what you were just talking about. The way I kind of understood it was that you could be. It's almost that the the end of the sutra or this god is like the um is the knowledge itself that makes you see or is the seeing with which knowledge is known something like that i i think he's a a herald or a symbol of that in that mm -hmm. way yep yeah. like i i i hear exactly what you're saying and i think yeah it's about like that the sutra embodies that idea and then this figure shows up at the end as an embodiment literally mm -hmm. quite in a way an embodiment of that idea mm -hmm. yep yeah cool mm -hmm. yeah and, and that's um thanks rami i really appreciate it because it's also part of what i'm trying to do here is like you know these are pretty standard tropes for mahayana sutras this sort of uh, an event like this at the end and I'm about to get to, or I would like to get to the uh, um, the realization of the non-arising of all dharmas and all of that. I want to try to get that, but that's also standard fare for the end of a sutra, kind of all the, everybody being transformed and excited in that way. I, I want to kind of, um, I, I want to try to get to that idea of like how um, these are tropes. Again, these are tropes of the Mahayana, and I'm ho I'm hoping to give you um, an insight into what they mean, so that when you see them again, you're like, oh, that's right. Oh, look, it's another banner or, or something to that effect. Yeah. Um, on that note, um, so you know, Durrani breaking all bonds, full liberation, being free. That one's pretty e uh, basic in that way. The Durrani that destroys boundless afflictions that are as giant as a mountain of diamonds. I mean, again, this is where the hyperbolic verbose language is getting like really out of hand in that way. The Durrani that understands the words expressing the equality of all dharmas, which I actually tried to sneak in there on you there um, with our, our uh, tracker of reality idea. <laughs> where did that come from? Um, the, the next one is uh, the Durrani understanding the, um, the language and the voice of reality. And that kind of pertains to what we were saying, I think with uh, Eric's comment a while back, Durrani's always having to do with uh, sound and language in some way. Um, and so this is not just a Durrani that might understand all, um, you know, the Durrani for understanding Esperanto, the Durrani for understand, you know, and, and this is no, this is the Durrani for understanding the language and sound of reality. In, in other words, if I could just tr try to give it its due credit, um, the Durrani that is sealed with the boundless purity revealed by emptiness there's honestly a way in which we could be here for many, many more sessions just to, talking about. And also, this was also a beautiful one too. It's so if I were just to read the English here, it's the Durrani. And remember, this is the inseparable Durrani imprinted by the seal of boundless purity that is revealed by emptiness. But what's beautiful in this actually is that you could translate it as the Durrani sealed by the seal of boundless purity as revealed by emptiness. It's like this, we're doubling down on our Durrani seal on this one. And it's about this idea of the, the, the purity that or equanimity in that sense, upeksha, revealed by emptiness. It's a big part of the sutra, the teaching of the sutra in the long run. 
And then the last one is the Durrani of achieving and manifesting boundless Buddha bodies. Very related to uh, infinite manifestations or boundless manifestations that I mentioned. But that was the Bodhisattva turning himself, you know, uh, I was a man, now I'm a woman, a woman, now I'm a man, or I'm a old person, now I'm young, or I'm this, I'm that. This one is the Durrani for achieving the manifestation of infinite Buddha bodies. So that's kind of of a higher order than just makeup. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. But um, so those are all the Durranis. And then, um, oh, and then it even says, of course, that if a Bodhisattva achieves all of these Durranis, or if they achieve Durranis like these, they will be able to transform themselves into Buddha forms to teach sentient beings in all lands in the 10 directions. However, in light of the true nature of all dharmas, there is neither coming or going. <laughs> so that's just right at the end, just when you thought like, wait, what the, it, it reminds you, don't, no, 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 we know. Nothing ever comes, nothing ever goes. That is the teaching of the sutra, right? The bodhisattva, right, does not cling to words. That they don't cling to words that they use to teach the Dharma. They remain impartial and steadfast. Although manifesting a body that lives and dies, in reality, nothing ever arises or ceases and not a single dharma ever comes or goes. So, and by the way, that's like, um, well, yeah, I have uh, other things to say, but I wanna me just mention really quickly that that's a very, 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 in my, in my opinion, frankly, it's a very beautiful sentiment um, in that sense. It's a very, very gentle, compassionate approach to mortality in that way. Yeah, um, I really like that line. Could you repeat it again? Because I was trying to catch it. Though manifesting a body. Although manifesting a body that lives and dies, in reality, nothing ever arises or ceases. And not a single Dharma ever comes or goes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the Bodhisattva, of course, realizing that all phenomena, all dharmas, all ideas, all concepts, all thoughts, everything, the Bodhisattva realizes that all dharmas, all phenomena are originally quiescent, already in nirvana, and thus they already abide securely in the Buddha Dharma. And why? Because the Bodhisattva makes no distinctions among dharmas. That's the end of like the teaching. That's the end of the sutra. It basically kind of ends on that point. The Bodhisattva makes no distinctions among dharmas. And, you know, distinctions is heavy because at a very gross level, of course, we're talking about distinguishing in terms of like, I don't know, beautiful, ugly, useful, not useful, harmful, beneficent, all the kind of basic ideas in which you could discern, or not discern, but discriminate different phenomena into different piles, let's say. Piles of good and piles of bad, piles of this, piles of that. But, you know, aesthetics, moral judgments of good and bad and all of that, that's kind of this one layer the ultimate teaching of a sutra like this is about the bodhisattva not making distinctions among dharmas at all. And that's a really wild idea. That's a really big wild concept that, you know, it's what took us sort of 32 weeks to sort of really kind of get at. And then it says, this is kind of what I wanted to just to end tonight by discussing. It says in, again, in classic Mahayana sutra format, it says that during the the, the preaching of this sutra, 30,000 bodhisattvas in the assembly achieved 
the patient tolerance for the non-arising of all dharmas. Innumerable bodhisattvas attain the state of non-regression from the pursuit of unsurpassable enlightenment. Innumerable sentient beings resolve to develop bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. And then fourth, innumerable monks and nuns attained a clarified dharma eye. So those are the four final kind of things of the sutra, the, the four kind of events. I kind of try to depict them a little bit here with my converted masses in that way. Um, so the, the first one where it says that all these 30,000 bodhisattvas developed the anupata dharani kashanti, right? This patient tolerance, this kashanti for the non-arising, the anupata of all dharmas or all phenomena, the anupata dharma kashanti. This is a, a um, well, within the Mahayana tradition, within the Bodhisattva path, this would be considered a samapati, an attainment or something to that degree. There's a way in which, you know, you just heard it, um, the, the beautiful line, which is that although a bodhisattva manifests a body that lives and dies, in reality, nothing ever arises or ceases. Not a single dharma comes or goes. That is the teaching of the birthlessness of all phenomena or the birthlessness of all dharmas. And there's basically two levels to this teaching. There's the initial just understanding of what the heck they're talking about. <laughs> like at, at just at an actual basic conceptual level of like, what is even being said by the non-arising of all dharmas? It's kind of a mouthful. So the, there's this first level of bodhisattva-ness, bodhisattvahood, which is just understanding what the non-arising of all dharmas means. And then along the way, a, a bodhisattva actually reaches a point in the cultivation and in development where they reach something that's called the patient tolerance for the non-arising of all phenomena. And those are sort of two different things in the sense that one is just sort of understanding it, but maybe not quite believing it, or maybe being a little disturbed by it or being a little whatever. So there's that period. And then there's this moment of this kashanti, this peacefulness or patience, but it's a very, you know, calm, abiding peacefulness kashanti is. And this is called the kashanti regarding or towards, but this peaceful tolerance for this very idea that all dharmas do not arise or cease and are neither born nor die in that way. So let's just talk about those real quick for our last few minutes here to kind of kind of flesh that out a little bit. Um, and it also pertains to the next uh, couple, the next two ideas. So the anupata Dharma Kashanti, or just this idea of the non arising of Dharma. So let's hold off on the patient tolerance for that idea. Let's just talk quickly about the basic idea. So, this whole Bodhisattva journey is about understanding ideas like emptiness, primarily, and at least in the initial stages. The Bodhisattva path is about understanding something called Pratitya Samudpata. And what the word or what the idea of Samudpata means is co-arising. And Pratitya Samudpata means dependent co-arising. And that's a very important Buddhist idea that's very related to the idea of emptiness. The, the basic fundamental idea of pratitya samudpata is that all phenomena 
arises from a collection of causes and conditions together, and that there's a way in which all phenomena sort of are co-arisen in a variety of ways, more ways than I can actually number. Um, but it's this idea of kind of a mutual codependence of all things on all other things. This is both like at a um, deep ecological level regarding resources and things like that and how we all breathe the same air and all of that. And so there is a vast interdependence or codependence or a codependent arising of all things at a very physical level. But then there's also a very subtle level of relativity where all things sort of are relative to all other things. Like what is tall? Well, it depends on what is short. And therefore all of a sudden, the tall person in the room is dependent upon the short person and doesn't get to just be the tall person all by themselves. There's a weird way in which in order for them to be the tall person, it requires the short person. And that's a kind of co-arising of the very ideas of tall and short because the same thing goes for the short person. In order for them to be understood that way, there needs to be the idea of tall person. And so there's this way in which a bodhisattva sort of sees everything as co-arisen, really depending on everything else and especially when we're in the world of dualities and opposites, like tall and short, beautiful and ugly and all these things. So that's kind of a, um, that realm of what's called dependent origination. And when you understand that things are co-arisen, you kind of understand the empty nature of tallness. And what I mean by that is, is that as soon as this person moves into another room where everybody's taller than they are, their tallness is gone. But wait, I thought they were tall. No, they weren't tall. They were tall relative to a room full of shorter people in that sense. And that reveals that they are not actually tall or actually male or actually whatever it's actually co-arisen. And so because, because they are co-arisen or pratitya samudbhata, individually they are empty of that particular quality, such as being tall or such as being male or such as being beautiful or whatever, it's all gonna be relative and therefore not actual in that sense. So that's the teaching of samudbhata. And the teaching of Samudpata, again, reveals the empty nature of all phenomena. But there is a kind of an even deeper level to the Dharma, or the teachings here. And that's this teaching of the Anupata Dharma, that actually nothing actually even arises or ceases. Nothing comes into existence or out of existence. And that speaks to its birthlessness. So anupatta is sometimes usually translated as birthlessness, but it's, you know, we're referring to people, beings, and also to stuff. And so the idea of the bodhisattva vision that is seeing things in terms of birthlessness, the, the classic example that I always give is this one, the fist. And it's the idea of, where did this fist come from? Where did it come from? Where, and oh, my favorite one, where did it go? And in that kind of scenario where the fist, well, the fist didn't come from anywhere and it didn't go anywhere. In fact, it isn't really even happening in that sense. And that's, the birthlessness, if I could put this really simply, the codependent arising or the pratitya samudpata, it speaks of emptiness. The non-arising, the birthlessness of phenomena, 
it speaks to something that's called tathata or suchness. And it's about this idea that when there is a fist, there's a fist. Look, here it is. And so behold, the fist, it is such. <laughs> and the idea is, is that now no fist. It is such, it is the case. It is tathata -ta that there's no fist. And it's not that the fist left us, it didn't come, it didn't go, it wasn't born, it wasn't destroyed. It's just that it isn't such. And so these teachings are very related, of course, the teaching of dependent origination and emptiness and the teaching of the non-origination of dharmas and suchness. They're very, very related, but there are subtle differences between the two. That was all just a basic way to really articulate what birthlessness is about, which is that all things are ultimately not created or destroyed, not born or die, but when something be, it be. And that understanding, again, is one step on the practice. Understanding it, what I just said is one step on the path. But actually being totally cool with that it be is the patient tolerance for the non-arising of all dharmas. And so 30,000 bodhisattvas achieved the state of the patient tolerance for the suchness of all dharmas or the non-arising of all dharmas in that way. It says that a bunch of bodhisattvas um, attain the state of non-regression from the pursuit of, of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. That's how this whole sutra started, was talking about the development of bodhicitta and the pursuit for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And the basic idea is, is that it, you might get it in your head that you want to become a fully enlightened being. You might say, you know what? This sutra sounds interesting. These stages and these paramitas, this sounds great. Sign me up. That's making the initial determination for enlightenment, which, uh, by the way, a bunch of um, innumerable sentient beings resolve to achieve bodhicitta. But before that, all of these bodhisattvas achieved the non-regressing state of, for the attainment. And that's the basic idea that you could say like, yeah, that sounds good. I'll start that next year or whatever. Or, oh yeah, I used to be into Buddhism, but I kind of fell off the wagon. I do, you know, I don't do my practice as much or whatever. At a certain point, the Bodhisattva reaches a non-regressing stage towards enlightenment where they are bound for it like water over a waterfall, that it, it, it is, that it's inevitable at a certain point, they say. And then finally, the last one, just to top this off, all of the old school Buddhist monks and nuns, the bhikshus and the bhikshunis, right? All of the shravakas, the voice hearers in the audience, they all obtained a clear dharma eye. And I just wanna just contextualize this very last part. The very, 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 very first sutra that the Buddha gave at the Deer Park to the five ascetics in which he turned the Dharma wheel by teaching the Four Noble Truths, in that earliest, oldest of suttas, in that first very teaching, at the very end, it says something very interesting, which is that of the five ascetics, there was one of them who got it, and his dharma eye was clarified. It took the other four a little bit of time, but they eventually got it. But what I want to point out is that the trope of having people at the end of a sutra get it has been a trope since day one. And this is just the Mahayana version where we've got these like, you know, the not birthlessness of all phenomena and 30,000 bodhisattvas. It's like, we've gone from one of five to 30,000 and all of that. 
but I just want you to know that it's very much in keeping with the tradition of a sutra to have such a thing. And in many ways, what that last one, the purified Dharma eye, is very much about viewing all phenomena equally, upekshikli or equanimously in that way, and not seeing certain dharmas as defiled and certain dharmas as pure but actually viewing all dharmas equanimously is the what it means to have a clarified dharma eye. And when the Buddha finished teaching this sutra, bodhisattva, akshayamati, the monks, the gods, the humans, the sorrows, the gandharavas, and so were jubilant. And they accepted it with faith and began to practice it and venerate it. All right, my friends, say tu, that's the sutra. We did Yay. it. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you all so much for being here, for enduring the, 